you could go to sweet. You could go to sweet potatoes or cassava and so on. And then you come back again with a fruit crop like tomatoes or pepper or melon gene. What you do when you practice like that, you break up the cycle that the insect prefers to have or the particular fungus. And because you break the cycle, they disappear. The second approach to organic farming is using green manure. What is a green manure? Well, if you have a lot of bush in your yard, um, plants that you are destroying, dying plants that are uprooted, you put that back into the soil in order to make them act as a nutrient for the next crop. So it's like recycling the nutrient. The plant would have taken the nutrient from the soil, but when you break it up, when you root it up and break it up and put it back in the soil, you're returning nutrients to the soil. And that is referred to as green manure. Then you have biological pest control. That is where you use living organisms to control other pests, okay, without the use of chemicals. Um, we very, very rare in Trinidad, you'll get biological agents that you could buy in the store to use for biological control. But note that some are becoming more and more available. There's some agriculture shops that are offering biological pest, pesticides. Then composting is another one. Another way of getting nutrients back into the soil is composting material. That could be done as a, a, a half day course, people who want to load composting, but basically it's composed a high, highly rich in nutrients and it's recycled organic matter and it is used in place of fertilizers. Some people even use animals, but uh, it's not something I want to recommend. There are people who go to fish, fish processing plants and collect all the heads and the guts and they put it into the soil and let it rot and that produces nutrients for the soil. It's not something I like, but if you think it's something you want to, to try, you're free to do it. Now, the reason why organic agriculture is enforced in many nations is that it minimizes the use of various harmful chemicals that we spoke about earlier, okay? And there's more focus on using natural ways to enhance the quality of soil and cultivated crops. Organic agriculture is nothing more than a modernization in agriculture. It is a combination of science, technology, and nature. Following are different methods that I will give you. One is the crop diversity. In crop diversity, what you do, it's in one, if you had a garden at the back of your house, try not to plant all in lettuce or all in tomatoes. You try what is called polyculture. So instead of having monoculture, you have many crops, polyculture. And what happens is that you get a balance in the ecosystem. It's called balancing the ecosystem so that you don't get an attack of all the crops all at once by a particular insect. An insect might come for your tomatoes, you might get rid of it, but that same insect, if it multiplies, it would not attack the lettuce or the cabbage. The next area you wanna look at is soil management. Now, by doing a grow box, you are already managing what goes into the box in terms of your soil mix. And we said on a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, you use manure, you use some organic filler like sawdust. Long ago, we could have used baggers, but we don't have that. And you use some sharp sand. The sharp sand is to allow things to filter. Let me remind you that if you decide to use sawdust, it will be important to have it as cured sawdust. Because you may not get cured sawdust, it is good to use the chicken litter. The chicken litter provides that kind of medium you want in your grow box to allow for retention of moisture and production of nutrients for your plants. Okay, one of the best um, ways to enhance soil is the use of bacteria. But again, in Trinidad, you may not mm -hmm. get the proper bacteria that is sold, but I know of one or two shops in Shaguanas that is gearing themselves to selling these things so that people could develop the soil nutrients in any um, grow box system that they have. 
Another area is weed management. Weeds, just like the plants you want to grow, they need food. So if you leave the weeds to grow up in your pot or on the bed where you're producing your crops, they are taking away nutrients from your crop. So you need to remove the weeds. Okay, sometimes people argue it's not good to leave the soil totally weed free. And whereas that has its merit, know that the weeds will be taking away water and nutrients from your plants. Um, in another lecture, I'd suggested to someone, or maybe your next group, you could take old newspapers and actually put it on the soil, but you need to put pieces of wood or stone to hold on the paper to prevent grass from growing up if you don't want to use weedy sites. So weeds, weeding and keeping your field weed free is very important. Now in weed management, um, I just mentioned something that is called mulching. Using newspapers on the ground is mulching, but you could take the very weeds that you, you cut from the garden and cover the soil. It is important not to use weeds that have seeds because the seeds will just drop off and grow back again. And seeds could live for a very long time in the soil. So when you're mulching, mm -hmm. bear that in mind. Mulching is when you cover the soil with something, whether it's artificial or natural. Artificial will be like newspapers. Natural will be like you put some fig leaf or the bush that you cut to cover the soil. Okay, because eventually it will rot, enter the soil. It will also, while it's there, prevent weeds from growing. Okay, mowing and cutting, just, just being able to mow and cut. You know, people use whackers, but in a small scale with you doing something in a grow box, you just every morning look for any new weeds coming up or once a week and you just pull them out. And once the soil is moist, they're easy to come out. Okay. How about other dangerous organisms? While certain organisms prove to be beneficial to the health of a farm, there are many others that hamper the field. Today I circulated a picture, I repeat it, of a guava plant that was laden. It looked like about a hundred aphids on the last six or eight inches of the plant. And what they're doing, they get any the juiciest food that the plant should be benefiting from and they're just sucking out everything. What you want to do is learn to identify insects. And that's why I like the fact that as pathfinders and master guides, we have different um, honor badges that you do in insects. So you know, ladybugs are good, okay? Ladybugs will actually search the plant and find these aphids and eat them. But if you don't have ladybugs on your, in your yard, then you use the soap water, okay? Using herbicides and pesticides that are natural or contain less chemical, and I can't re-emphasize this enough, stay away from chemicals. There are chemicals that have been in use for years now that are now proven to be dangerous to the human body. I'll give you one common example. You know the one that they call Gramaxone? It comes by other names, like you have trade names like Paraquat. They have now found that Gramaxone or Paraquat or Diquat is giving people early Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yep, dementia. So you want to stay away from the use of some of these chemicals. Um, many years ago, like more than 20 years now, there have been a growing concern about a weedy side called um, sharks. It just slipped me. I haven't used that word for a while, but there is a, we decide when you spray, spray it, the grass will die from the root coming all the way up. You remember the name of it, James? Mm -hmm. James, you there? You remember the name of that? Huh? Yes, the glyphosate. Yeah, what's this, what's the um, commercial name? It's, it's Roundup, that's the- Roundup, that's the one. Roundup. Yeah. And people like to use it because a little touch of it on the plant, it goes into the plant and kills everything from the root come up. They are finding out that those things cause cancer because some of it remains in the soil and gets taken up into your plants because they make them friendly for certain plants. Okay, thanks very much, James. Proper sanitization of the entire farm in order to keep it free from pests. And I want to point out 
somebody else posted a plant, maybe it's the other group of a fungus on their mint, Circospora and mint, and there are a couple other similar fungus. When you get it on herbs and it becomes plentiful, sometimes it's better to just destroy the crop and plant over. And in the case of mint, I advise cut off all leaves, burn them. Home here on my yams, I saw about 10 leaves yesterday with Sucaspera. What I did is I just removed the leaves, put them in the garbage so they're out of the yard. Because if you break them off and rub them on the ground, later on the spores dry, blowing the wind and going up. And so you don't harbor the organism. So you discover that a lot of the control that can be done is done personally by you. Somebody showed a plant, I think it was the same plant with if no, somebody showed a citrus fruit with some insects. From what I see in the picture, it looked like some kind of beetles. All right, from all information I have, it could be a beetle. But you know, that person could have simply walked with a little pan with some soap water and just uh, shake the insects off in the pan. As soon as they drop in the pan, they will drown. So you don't have to be go, uh, spraying the whole tree with some chemical because there's some insects on one fruit. Get rid of the insects. If you want to really identify it, you keep one in a little bottle, pass it to the Ministry of Agriculture and we'll get the entomologists to try to identify it. But I don't think you want to identify the exact name once you know it's a beetle, a beetle is a beetle is a beetle, and we'll tell you what to do with it. What they're doing on the on the fruit, they're sucking or rasping the fruit. Okay. I will send the, these notes that I'm using here tonight so that you can have a proper read of it. I'll put it on the group chat so that you all will see it. Okay. Organic agriculture has been conducted by many countries with the rejection of using techniques and chemicals that harm animals, crops, soil, environment, and even human health. And such a process of agriculture should be encouraged since it acts as a protective shield to all the main factors that form the planet. And we just spoke about biological pest control, composting, crop rotation, green manure, other methods, and of course, organic farming. Any questions up to this point? Um, there's something called converting your farm from traditional farming to organic. That's our next course by itself, our next lecture, next session. But normally it takes like three to five years to convert a farm from traditional conventional farming practices to organic. And that's because the chemicals need to be to, to wear off. Note too that if you're doing 100% organic farming, and especially if you want certification, you need to have certified organic seeds. When I was in Venezuela with a big organic project that was 70,000 acres, we also argued if you want the cows to give you manure that could be considered organic manure, then the cows must be fed organic grains. It could be fed grains with chemicals, all right? So just know you could stretch the idea of organic very far. Note too that you could have some plants in your backyard and your neighbor spraying next door. They're spraying for mosquitoes. They're spraying for all kinds, they're even spraying their crops. And there's something called drift, where because the chemicals drift across to you and go on the crop, it's not considered organic anymore. So you must tell your neighbor you're not using chemicals and when they spray, they must tell you. So you could just spread a sheet or something over your plant pots, all right? So I will send these notes, as I said, top 10 reasons I want to give you for going organic. Organic is the food system most heavily regulated in the United States. And if you want to see regulation, go to Japan or Switzerland. They are really regulated. Uh, so that when you buy a crop that is labeled organic, you show what went into it or what did not go into it. 
Okay? Organic crops are also more nutritious. And you know, uh, as people who want to live healthy, if you use nutritious crops, you will be more healthy. You will be more safe from diseases. Growing organic crops also helps combat climate change. So at some stage, even among the officers in the Ministry of Agriculture, you may hear them speaking and championing the cause of organic agriculture because it averts that situation of climate change. You know, they say if we go up by 2.5 degrees, the islands in the Caribbean will then be in trouble. Huh? It helps to, uh, to, um, to have fewer pesticides being used in food, which is what you want. You don't want to be using food wondering if there's pesticide residue in it. It's also going to be GMO free because once there's GMO involved, it's not organic. Number six, fewer synthetic fertilizers. Synthetic fertilizers get washed into our streams and rivers. And what that does in the end, it pollutes our fish life. And when you eat those fish, you end up with some problem. You know, you, you, you wouldn't hear people say when they open the fish, the liver look like it had a cancer. They just say, oh, this has a strange looking liver boy. And they clean up the fish and you eat it. We've been eating all kinds of things. You know, one writer said, the day would come when we realize we have to stop eating even fish. If you are not, uh, if you're still eating meat, not eating meat, but eating fish. One important thing is organic doesn't allow you to use sewer, sewer sludge. Sewer sludge could be used um, in agriculture, but for organic agriculture, it cannot be used. Sewer sludge is when they take human waste, when the sewer truck come by your home and empty your sewer tank, and they treat it and bag it and sell it as fertilizers. Antibiotics. In livestock agriculture, antibiotics are used. In vegetable and tree crop farming, antibiotics are not used. There's no use for antibiotics in crops. But in livestock, antibiotics could be used. So if you want organic meats, for instance, you have to stay away from some of those things that they feed those animals, including hormones. So antibiotics is one category that would make livestock not organic and then hormones that help to beef them up, so to speak. Those hormones induces cancer formation in the human body. And then, of course, the final one, humane animal treatment. And there's a, that's a whole topic by itself, where the animals must get exercise and space to walk around. And like you might put two chickens in an acre of land because they must roam all over the place and then they're considered organic chickens, all right? So that's my brief expose on organic farming methods. I want to go on to a topic to me, in my opinion, which needs specific attention. And I think we'll have a lot of conversations after this course and after you've graduated of how to manage without pests, sorry, without pesticides. And the topic is prevail against pests without pesticides, okay? Um, they say today, in today's world, we have an array of pests. We have ants in our kitchen, wasps in our bedroom, squirrels in our storeroom, bugs in our garden. How do we manage without pesticides? So without going into any heavy stuff, the, four, the, the, the prefix to, to this, so this whole topic is the amount of pesticide we are using today. Do you know now if I buy a fruit, I make sure I wash it with soap? Just to give you a hint as to how much pesticides we get in food. Go to the um, fruit stall and look at some of the popo that are for sale. And you see this bluish tinge on the popo, that's copper fungicides. For them to come along with fungus while they're ripening. But the thing is, when you hold those things and then you slice into it, your hands go into the flesh that you have to eat. So you might be eating some of the pesticides. So I always warn people with the extent of pesticide use to make sure, one, I store them for an extra day or two. And secondly, I wash the outer part. So when I get a, 
uh, let's say um, a watermelon or a pumpkin, I wash it with soap. Then I proceed to um, cut and then peel because my hand is going on the skin and my hand will go into the flesh and some of the pesticides will bleed from my, will contaminate from my hand into the flesh. Okay, there are some pesticides and I wouldn't list them here. I'll just name a few. There are some pesticides that are persistent in the soil. And there are some that are called POPs, which is persistent organophosphates. And they have learned that persistent organophosphates actually cause cancers and cancers on the increase. I don't know why one of every 10 of my friends, when I talk with them, if I didn't speak with them for a while, they tell me of somebody we know, friend we have in common who has cancer. It's on the rise. Long ago when I was a little boy, there were some chemicals we used to use that were really dangerous that are now banned. But there are some that we take for granted like malathion and parathion and others that rhyme with that. And there are other chemicals like, um, you all know, we used to use seven powder for ants. Seven powder is also um, carcinogenic. It's also banned. How some people get it still, I don't know. And diazinon that we used to use on Bodhi. I remember at Ekiaf as a student, that was the number one go-to chemical. If you want to control some things. But diazinon is banned. Um, seven is known as cabaril. So it, cabaril is the active ingredient and you have different trade names. Okay. Any of you use bagon in your house? I just want to advise you that is not a good chemical. If I'm forced to use bagon, I spray and I leave the house and come back the next hour. Open up and let it, let it air out. But um, I, I'll tell you an incident. Don't repeat it all over the place. Um, someone sprayed their facility with bagon because they had moths, moths attacking the cocoa in storage. When that cocoa reached in Switzerland, they tested it and found the, the chemical. It is the same chemical that is used against the locusts in the locust bed to kill locusts. Fortunately, that chemical is not taken up by the cocoa plant in the air. It must be applied in the soil and then taken up in the roots. So I was able to prove that the ministry was not at fault. And in fact, what the person was doing is hiding the fact that they bought a tin of bagon. They store the cocoa too long. The moths, which is a pest and storage products, agricultural produce, the moths start to hatch and he just sprayed the moths. But by spraying, some of it went into the cocoa. Bagon is something that is banned in the European Union. So if you get any foods from us that has that uh, particular active ingredient, they dump it, they burn it. And we must become familiar with some of these. So I'll send to you a list. Things that have chlorine in it or benzene, those are the things that cause uh, cancer. Long ago, we had some dangerous weedy sides. You spray the grass, you don't see a blade of grass for six months. Uh, Brother James would remember things like 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Those things are extremely dangerous, not to be played with. And Brother James mentioned glyphosate. It's a nice magical uh, weedy side, but we want to stay away from those, okay? Mm -hmm. Then there's the issue of pesticide resistance. And people think if you spray the insect, um, the next day you spray again, the third day you spray, they develop a resistance. It's not, it doesn't happen just like that, but resistance develop. I'll just spend 10 seconds to explain it so you know it. In any population of insect or animals, you put a certain dosage, 90% would die. What we do as humans, and it is found to be among ladies more than men, you know, you see a cockroach in the kitchen and you take up the bacon and you start to spray and you start to follow the cockroach all over the place till you see it drop dead or it might get away. The idea is the first spray you give it is supposed to kill it, but you need to leave it, let it go and die. 
But I think we grew up in a society where we see these movies, you know, somebody pull a gun in the movies and they shoot you one time, two times, 20 times, 100 times before they stop. So they want to see you dead, dead, dead. Well, we do that with insects sometimes. And when you do that, instead of killing 90%, you'll kill 95%. The 5% that survive, they are super insects. They go on to make babies that are super, super insects. So sooner or later, the same dosage you're using cannot kill them. So it's not like they're developing resistance. It is you killing out the weak ones and saving the strong ones only. But if that 10% was saved, that should have been that, that you want to kill, then when they mate, they produce equally weak ones that you could continue killing. And that is how we produce um, pesticide resistance and in insects and sometimes fungus and so on. All right, so who are the ones who are most susceptible to pesticides? I want you to know pregnant women. Pregnant women. So you must, you must, you must be able to teach your kids how to stay away from pesticides, how to stay away from pesticide-free crops, because in your own family, you will have daughters and they would grow up to the stage where they would become pregnant. And sometimes they don't understand why they can't keep the pregnancy or if they lose the baby, what's the reason for it? Um, there are simple things like heavy metals without frightening you all. Some soils in Trinidad carry heavy metals, especially cadmium. And there are some crops that pick up more cadmium than others. So the whole uh, family range of brassicas, brassicas will be a cabbage, broccoli, uh, what else you have, pachoy, cauliflower, those kale, kale. Those things scavenge the soil and take up the cadmium for spite, if, <laughs> so to speak. Cocoa is known to do that as well. And in Europe, they have, they have become uh, aware of that and they demand that our cocoa be tested so it doesn't have a certain level of cadmium. I just want to advise you that the same thing could happen in vegetables. And sometimes as farmers or householders, we use fertilizers that are laced with cadmium. So you add in cadmium already to the plant, although the soil may have. Before I left the government, um, job, I wanted to lobby in the Ministry of Agriculture through the steering committee that we force the companies to tell us how much cadmium is in their fertilizers and to advise our farmers not to buy it so they will stop selling it. It is happening. I myself, while I was at the cocoa company, we tested at least 20 fertilizers and found almost all to be high in cadmium. When you use those, it adds more cadmium to, this, to your crops. Your question is, what does cadmium do to you? Well, once you reach to our age, me and James and Sister Gabrielle, mm -hmm. once you cross 40, 50, what happens is your brain starts to get demented because of cadmium. You come down with Alzheimer's. And for women, if you get pregnant and the cadmium level in your blood is high, you will lose the baby. The baby would abort. So it's important to know some of these things and get acquainted with um, what pesticides do, how they could be harmful, how would they affect your crops. Even in your bathroom and in your kitchen, you use chemicals, eh? and sometimes we overuse these chemicals. When you mop your floor and then walk barefooted on, on residues on the floor, when you spray in your house, when you shampoo, when you use soaps, when you sit in underarm deodorants. And I thought I'd raise these because all of this has to do with your own health concerns. But I know you have not been seeing my face and I'm not able to show slides, but I will send all of these to you um, by uh, tonight, if I get back electricity or tomorrow, so that you will have it to read. I just want to tell you that there are some foods that carry very low pesticide. You could be assured based on how it's grown, it carries low pesticide. Broccoli, pineapple, asparagus, sweet corn, cabbage, 
sweet peas, avocado, mango, banana, onions, melangin. And there's some that carry way, way up high levels of pesticides. Peaches, apples, bell peppers, nectarines, strawberries, grapes, pears. Be careful with um, lettuce, celery, and spinach. Sometimes I buy some of these things just because I like them. And when I bring them home, the next day, if I put them in a bowl, you could smell the pesticides in them. It's weird. But when you eat that, you're endangering your own health. All right. I want to pause here because I've done a lot of talking. And um, you might have a question based on what I've said. And I prefer if, as competent people are on this team right now, Brother James and myself, and anybody else who has some extensive knowledge, we could help answer some questions. Any questions? I'm still in the dark here, no electricity. And I wanted to use the computer, so I'm in front of it instead of going in the car and put on some car lights. I didn't have a chance we to- We are barely on. seeing you, Bullet Granger. We're seeing you a little bit. Yes, a little outline. Yeah, I don't know so why I'm here. Um, I said we are seeing you. Okay, all right. But I, for some reason, the volume is low. But questions, we would like to get some questions, please. Wetting up your plants, the time frame, what time do you wet your plants? What is the best time to wet the plants, your plants? I cannot hear in you. Somebody will have to relate the question to me because for some reason, my volume here has been cut. I'm just hearing a, a faint sound in the background. She's asking, what time do you wet the plants? Wetting of plants, what time is the best time to wet your plants? OK, is that a question directed to me? Somebody asked that question earlier to you. OK, could you, could you repeat the question? I'm holding the phone to see if I can hear. What time is the best time to wet your plants? Oh, best time is morning time. The best time is morning time. You try not to wet your plants too late in the evening. The reason is you do not want to leave the leaves of your plant wet. In the night, as things become still, and the atmosphere slows down with speed, wind speed, spores in the atmosphere come and rest on the leaves. And if the leaves are wet, they germinate and you get fungal diseases. So you want to wet the plants at a time of day where you give them enough time to dry themselves. It's like long ago as kids, our parents would tell us, don't shower in the night. And we didn't have the facility of hair dryer and all of that. Or if they, if they let you shower, they say, don't wet your head. So the idea is not to have wet leaves going to sleep in the night. I see people wet their plants and they feel there's some compulsion where you must um, wet the whole plant. That is not required. I'll go to my car where I can put on some light. Yeah, it's really dark. I can't even see myself walking. Yeah, I have to walk. Yeah, next question. Is there next question? Okay, so I'm on. Any other question? I hope I didn't mute anything. No, I didn't mute. And we have 25 participants, that's really nice. 
Fighting Brother Granger, by way of adding to what you said, um, a challenge that, that people have, and they probably may not be aware of it, is that they water and they allow the soil to dry out or the medium to dry out, and then they water again. And, and that you you like effect affects a lot of plants so that especially if you're using things planting things like watermelon that irregular watering creates blossom end so that you want to make sure that you have a constant supply of water it doesn't have to be over watering and the beauty about having the soil moist is that when you do have to water you don't have to water too much at the at, at one point in time so you want to ensure that you have you know, adequate water in over time. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between the water water and the rain water? Mm -hmm. so farmers, farmers tell you that they, there's a significant difference they notice when they irrigate during the dry season and when rain falls. There might be some truth to that. What happens is when you water, you only interfere with the with the microclimate around the plant. But when the rain falls, it interferes with the climate further afield. In addition to that, the, the, the thinking is that the water coming through the atmosphere dissolves ozone in the water so that you end up having an additional um, effect. It might be ozone, it might be other things, but rainwater certainly gives you you know, a better, a, a, the, the plant feeds, it's more natural to the plant anyway. So you're going to see some difference that is, is um, positive when, when, when you have rain fed as opposed to irrigation water. Excuse, there's somebody whose mic is muted. Can you mute your mic if you're not speaking, please? Thank you. Because all I'm seeing you all and you're seeing me, I'm not hearing you all at all. Okay, so Ava's hand is up. Ava, go ahead. Ava, you can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, Good night, everyone. And so I just want to find out. Ava, your mic is muted. I just want to find out how long it will take the sawdust to rot. Because I have some sawdust, but it's not rotting at all. Oh, yeah, unmute this thing. Remember, remember sawdust is generally wood that was would have been not rotted, would have probably been green. And so if you try to use it immediately, you, you're literally using green on rotted wood. Um, the benefit of sawdust as a medium is that you could add it to, to your other planting medium to give you some, some lightness. But if you're using pure sawdust and it's not well rotted and it takes some time to rot, you don't have some problems. One of the one of the drawbacks of using unrotted sawdust is that the process of rotting uses nitrogen. And if you put if you put nitro, if you put unrotted sawdust or any unrotted medium in your soil, the plant will be suffering for nitrogen because the nitrogen actually really be nutrifying the plant. And giving them that lost vegetation growth is now used by the bacteria that breaks down the bacteria. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you will very well find that your plant shows up, even though you're fertilizing, the plant shows up signs of lack of nitrogen, like yellowing and that kind of thing, small leaves and that kind of thing, because the nitrogen is being utilized by the bacteria to break down the, the medium that's gone rough. Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you, sir. Rotted material, okay. you have an idea when it's well rotted. Um, if you know what sawdust looks like, well rotted sawdust will be closer to what you expect when you're doing something, when you're getting something like humus or you're getting compost. It, it gives you that feel. So when you wet it, it will, it will, it will clump and the color will change a bit. It's, it's difficult to describe it, but once you have a feel for what sawdust looks like and you have a feel for what rotten, what the people call rotten mortal, then you have an idea what's in between those two states would give you. And, and, and the more rotted, the better. Yeah, I heard snippets of it. And uh, those guys, both Gabriel and um, James, they are on the ball, very much on the ball. What they're telling you is so right and on the point. Um, I found that there's someone in Maruga had, was it 20 bags of chicken manure ready for sale? They did that just yesterday. So if I didn't post it on this site, I will do that so that if you need to buy some manure, you could get. But if you go in the forest, if you have um, lands behind your house and trees that are fallen, you could get rotten wood and add to your cotton mixture. But what Brother James was saying about the sawdust is very, very correct. Uh, to help it rot, you might want to add a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer and keep it wet. If it's dry, it wouldn't rot properly. Okay. Ava, I see your hand is still up. Do you have another no, question, Ava? No, no, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Um, I'm trying to put on my hand. Okay. Any other questions, anyone else? Or comment anyone want to make? Because we want to wrap up in a short while. I didn't hear from Donna. I didn't hear from Tanik. I didn't hear from Mary. Sheldon, you're good? Sheldon? Yeah, you're good. All right. Good. I want all of you to pay attention to the assignment you got. It's not a big assignment. I just want that you have a more educated approach to what you're doing. Your difference between the grow box on the ground or the grow box up in a box. Or, and in doing your actual planting, whether you prefer to plant in a pot, a bucket, an old drum, an old container, or a box that you make. It's just to have an appreciation of what you're doing. I want you to be comfortable with what you're doing and be able to defend what you're doing and plan something, all right? If you didn't plan something, um, then you would have defeated the whole idea about this course, okay? And uh, before all of you came in, I said I would want to continue with another course, um, maybe in January, because I promised Aruka Church we'll do seasonings and herbs in December. And we're looking at 20 different herbs. We're looking at Spanish thyme, French thyme, sive, bandania. We're looking at dill, marjoram, fenugreek, fennel, you know, a whole range of things that could be used for medicinal purposes as well as culinary purposes. We'll even look at lemongrass and ginger and turmeric, a couple other things, okay? I want to say it was really a privilege to have all of you. It is a joy for me to get together with people like Sister Gabrielle and Brother James to do this production for you all. And we will leave the chat running so you can ask questions. I wish we could have more participation. Sister Gabrielle will put on, or I will post it later. I want you to send in your assignments to me at Royal Health. 12 at gmail.com. Um, by okay. Leon, yes. I, I, I place it in the chat here okay. right now. And I also okay. placed it on the WhatsApp chat. And as you asked, I, I also put back the videos for the various class to so make it fresh in your mind. 
as well as the assignments fresh in your mind and the new deadline for the assignment, which is December 5th. So if you go to the group chat, you will see all the information that you need there together with um, Brother Granger's email address where you need to send your assignment. As he said a while ago, this is our last class and we want to wrap up in a little while. So I want to ask most of you as far as possible, if you can put on your cameras, we can at least see you for the last time at this class. And we want, if Brother Leon doesn't have anything else to say, I want to ask Sister Diane Thomas to do a vote of thanks for us. So can you put on your cameras, please? Some of you, he never saw you. I know most of you, but some of you, Brother Leon, never saw what you looked like. Yeah, so. if I spot them in Princess Town, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah. So as okay. you all put on your cameras, it's nice to see you all. And Sister Diane, over to you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to say a special thanks to Mr. Granger for all the information that you gave to us over the past few weeks. Mr. Granger, it has been very, very informative. It's enlightening and it has, it will put us to the task to do the best that we could. Some of the things we would have known and some we would not have known. So we are very, very grateful for all the information. We wanna thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making this class so interactive, so interesting and so informative. And I am sure that with my other colleagues, we would be looking forward to the next session with you. So we wanna thank you very, very much. And we also wanna thank Sister Gabrielle for the interesting work that you have done, putting this class together for us so that we can all benefit. Thank you again very much, Mr. Granger. You're welcome. You're welcome, Diane. Thank you very much. And Brother well, Granger and James Williams. I don't know if James left, but James and even Mrs. Miss Marcia Mitchell, who was also a part of the class, and my other colleague Salim Shah, who did the hydroponics for you all. I thank the members of the Ministry of Agriculture that chipped in the help. They continue to be a part of our chat group. I continue to encourage you to send your questions, your pictures pictures and stuff, we're not going to close the book. So that's going to be a, a form of information ongoing and support for you as you do your assignment and hand it in by December 5th. As I said in the chat, our graduation proposed date is December the 12th. We don't have the time right now to decide which way we will do it, but on the chat, we'll make the final decision whether we want to have a face-to-face -face graduation at Princess Town or our virtual graduation. So folks, thank you very much for your time. It has been nice. And I hope that, you know, it has really been informative and it's gonna help you in your home, in your community, and also those of us at church in the pantry project to help persons in our church who may need as well as our church community. So thank